this is sensitive, but so I'll just speak generally here, okay? If the sob story, so to speak, is um, a real deviation from the norm, debts in the immediate family, personal real crisis, like your life, your own life is on the line, that kind of stuff. That context is worth it. Like that's that should explain, you know, a 1.8 GPA, uh, you know, like my immediate family members died. Well, okay, you know what? You get a pass for that semester. It's okay. You know what I mean? Um, so if if the sob story is really like, oh my god, that's you know, all hands up, like free pass on this, then I think it's worth telling for about a paragraph. Okay. If the sob story is uh, my high school wasn't that rigorous and uh, uh, West Point Engineering was, holy cow, what was this? I wasn't ready. That sob story is not worth writing too much about. We get that. you know. And also, if it's just general, like it wasn't even that. It wasn't even the disparity between my high school and my college. Even if it's not, if, that's understandable. But even if it's like even less... Uh, less defensible, less excusable than that. Like, oh, I was just 18. I wasn't a serious student. Like, if, if it was simple as that, then we don't need to spend much time talking about it. Um, uh, less than median GPAs are not deal breakers. Uh, thankfully, MBA programs uh, are looking at this holistically. If this was some other master's program or a PhD program, the GPAs would be deal breakers, straight up. Um, but an MBA is looking at leadership. Um, so uh, even at the schools like UVA, an elite school that you're looking at, it, you know, they'll give some passes, all right? So I would say, and not just, this is not Utah's, but to anyone out here, like if my if my reason is not like, holy cow, that's serious. If it's just like, no, nah, I just wasn't that serious back at 18, 19, or school was really hard for me, I wouldn't spend much time on that, but I would focus more on um, how I change, how my trajectory has has changed. They do look at your last two years trajectory more so than your first year. They look at the upswing. If, the, if there's an upswing, that's fantastic. That mitigates. If there's a downswing in like year four, then that's even, then you have to really explain like what's up with that. The senior right is ain't, ain't, ain't cool. Um, or just easy classes. I mean, there are, they are academics. They understand what the transcript looks like, right? They understand oh, this is a nine credit course load. Like, what's up with this? You know? Uh, so, um, I would say if there's a trajectory upswing, make sure they know about that. It's like two sentences on that. Uh, I got serious. I figured it out. Um, and then, uh, Thomas, uh, I would then talk about, I've also, to make myself ready for the rigors of your program, I've also sought out X, Y, and Z to make sure I hit the ground run. Right? So it's more about the future. Like, don't like, listen, that was me at 19. This ain't me at 26. I'm a different dude right now. I'm a different person right now. Uh, my standardized test score is perhaps evidence of my uh, aptitude. But beyond that, beyond that, um, I've taken these classes to shore up uh, my issues. So for all of you, if you have like a, a not so good grade um, in your transcript that is relevant to a business school, econ, stats, some math class, if it's like, you know, a C or worse, I would go to Coursera, spend the hundred bucks and take the on-demand class. But this is all post, post, post standardized test. I wouldn't do it really concurrently. This is just like a little feather uh, on the cap kind of thing. This is a little icing on the cake kind of thing. This is not a big deal. If your other stuff's like, the primary thing is making sure your standardized test is good and your essays are cohesive. But if you're, those are cool, then I would add on some Coursera stuff. I would add on some MBA math stuff. Um, uh, HBX has this core thing. I don't, I'm not hating on it. I just don't think, well, I've been told it's not really worth the bang for the buck. It's pretty expensive for what for what the value is, what you're going to get. I think um, MBA math is just fine. I think Coursera, edX, something like that for $100 would be fine. Um, uh, if there's significant GPA issues, like we're talking about, like I barely graduated, then certainly, um, and there's like a lot of classes that are like, I took business as an undergrad. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of D's and F's in finance and accounting. Well, that would be concerning to a business school because, wait a minute, you're about to take these classes again. So <laughs> imagine, imagine uh, uh, applying for a job and saying, at the last, my last job, which is the same job as this one, I didn't do that well. Well, wait a minute, that's a flag. Um, so if I had 
some accounting, finance, econ classes that I failed. Then I would probably do, again, this is post standardized testing. I would maybe do the on-demand Coursera stuff, but depending on how bad it is, I might also do um, like uh, Berkeley extension, UCLA extension, UVA extension, uh, put down the thousand bucks and like take the real class, the, take the undergraduate class. This just show intent. It's like, listen, listen, listen. This is how real I am. You might even want to refill. Like, and those are real grades. Those are the best schools, you know. And the reason I pick public schools is because they're a little cheaper. Georgia Tech, UVA, Berkeley, UCLA, top notch uh, schools, and uh, they have their extension, which is fully granting degrees. I wouldn't mind taking a business probability class there because if I had an F back then, I can fix that now. But this is all post. Uh, I would really talk about like the commitment. And you know what? Even if you can't finish the course before you apply, just tell them you're taking it. As long as, long as you're not live, like, I'm taking it. Just so you know, this is you're you're gonna get a different person than that 19 year old back then. I know the issue, I know your concerns. Let me just stop you at the past. Like I know what your issue, I know what your issues are, I get it. This is how I'm proactively addressing them. And uh, I'm gonna kick butt when I get there in July. That's how you do it. So it is more about the future story times. Yeah, that makes total sense. I appreciate yeah. it, please. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a question. Yeah, um, Benjamin. Hey, uh, so how serious are engineering students taken when it comes to MBA programs? Um, I know I majored in systems engineering for undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I did pretty well, probably around the median GPA, but uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know an idea that they take it serious and also I ended up doing a little of uh, division one athletics. Do they even take that into account? Just wondering. Yeah, you know, all of that stuff is wonderful stuff. Um, um, you know, engineering uh, at most schools is, is pretty rigorous. And although the math you did isn't exactly, you know, finance or probability math necessarily, they know full well that you can probably handle the courses. So uh, it is, uh, certainly viewed favorably um, in that they would have less concern over an engineering transcript uh, than they would over a person who doesn't have one. So, for example, if I don't have any sort of math or business in my background, it's not a deal breaker at all. They certainly want all kinds of people, a diversity of thought and experience. It's just that for those people who studied, let's say, dance, I, I doubt that's many of you in this military room, but let's say you studied modern dance as an undergrad. Well, then, you know what? That's awesome. You're you're going to be a, a different experience here. Uh, we, we want you to have you, but we just want to make sure when you jump in that you can swim. So your standardized test score really matters, you know. But so if you're uh, an engineering, uh, you know, let's say three, six engineering uh, candidate and your standardized test score, believe it or not, matters a, a smidge less because like they know you can handle it. They know you can handle, you know, probability and statistics and uh, you know, uh, quadratic equations that is finance, you know, they, they, they know it can handle it. Um, that they like that. And with regard to athletics, uh, that's also a plus because, you know, uh, especially D1 athletics, uh, Benjamin, uh, I think everyone knows that D1 athletics is like a part time job. It's 23 hours a week, it's disciplined, um, it's team based as well, uh, I imagine. Um, so uh, it's all positive. Those are all, that's a really positive extracurricular. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I actually have one other question. Yeah, um, go ahead. So I've talked to a lot of my friends and the people who are getting into business schools and some, you know, uh, seniors when I was a freshman and they're getting into their business schools now. Uh, it seems as if, uh, there are some wild card schools that some of my friends have gone into and they've been rejected from a mass of other regular schools. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how to put this. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, uh, they, I've seen wardens a wild card school that they'll get shot down from six of eight of their other business schools, but then they get into warden somehow. And then I've also seen that to be the case with Haas as well. Yeah. Where, yeah, where I've talked to enough people and they just, they end up getting into that school over 
a mass rejection from a bunch of other business schools. Is there something that you've noticed with their admissions process and how they select? I, I think my, my comment is more general than it would be for Berkeley or Wharton. Um, uh, in, in my uh, experience, and I, in, I think, and this is, this is just fact, I think we've had more Wharton admits than any other school in our, in our history. Like I think pretty much every year Wharton is our number one, uh, where, our, where our students go the most. So I have, a, I have some idea about them, but um, uh, Wharton to me is not like, uh, a school that I would generally say is like uh, outliers come in. Um, uh, I think that, or, or Berkeley. Uh, what I think, Benjamin, is is uh, what you're seeing is just little anecdotal evidence of what I know to be true in a much larger pool, which is that um, whatever you think, number one, number two, number three, number seven, number 15, number 20 is, um, it's not nearly as um, fixed as you might think, okay? Because, uh, you know, basically number one is like, there's three, four schools you can argue are number one. And there's like 15 schools that are in the top 10. And there's like 32 schools that are in the top 25. Um, and those things move too. Like uh, not all schools are winning every year. Uh, some schools are better managed than others, other schools. So there are schools that, that are, frankly, number 17 today that might be number 10 by the time you graduate. Um, that's not, that could happen, okay? So I think what people think is, uh, what they're surprised by is like, they have this uh, impression of a school as, why would a school rank number seven um, accept this person and a school rank number 13 reject? And the truth is, those seven and 13 are probably much more similar than you think. This is not uh, the Olympic Games where an Omega clock, you know, tells you exactly who's the fastest person is, who's the second fastest, fastest person is, who's the third and who's 10th. That's how this works. It's far more about fit. It's also far more about this unknown at the moment, uh, uh, this game where you're not sure who else is applying at that school in that round who's like you. And that's why differentiation is so important, right? So your friends who are maybe the wild cards, Benjamin, I, I'm not surprised that wild cards get in. I, I am I'm not surprised that wild cards get in because they might get they might they might have benefited from you know other wild cards that apply um, to that school at that time. So in general, uh, what I've, I I know this to be true. Like uh, I would like all of you. I certainly advise this of all the students I counsel. Um, you have to spread the spread the bets. You'll you the, you will be surprised at who says no, and you will be surprised at who says yes. Um, uh, it's just uh, a, 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 there's a little bit of luck of the draw. There's also a little bit of like the person who reads your application, whether it resonates with that person a little bit, whether how, and how much they'll go back go to bat for you. Also, there's a little bit of human stuff here, like the networking. You know, how hard did you, you know, how much. Uh, how much networking did you do? And is there an advocate on the inside for your application, right? Uh, so uh, in general, I'm not surprised at these like atypical outcomes. I'm always surprised at what, where it happens. But I'm not surprised that an atypical outcome occurs if someone applies to um, a few schools, for sure. So in general, all of you uh, should apply to more schools than you think. Um, and not just to increase your odds at this game, but also, uh, even if it's like, you know, this is my seventh favorite school, and if school number two says yes, I'm not even worrying about number seven. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. If seven says yes and two says yes, uh, you know, I'm not saying that schools like to negotiate. In most schools, uh, flat policy is they don't. But I've, I've seen them. I've seen some schools negotiate and uh, change their offer. It's not something that I like to publicize, but. I've seen it. I, I'm not going to name names. I don't get anyone in trouble. But uh, no. And you can't negotiate if you don't have leverage. Right? Uh, if I got into number three and number two, and uh, I really want to go to number two, but, I'm not, and I, but uh, uh, I'd like, to the, like them to do the full uh, GI Bill for me and whatever. I want to do uh, a little bit more uh, uh, on my uh, out of pocket. Well, what leverage do I have if I don't have any other options? 
Like, you want options, right? So um, spread the bets a little bit. Uh, to Owen's question from the beginning, like, uh, adding back, like, the sixth school or the seventh school, if you do it right, if you triage this properly, isn't going to be that much more work because you probably have the content written elsewhere that, you know, that you're going to repurpose. If you already applied to six schools, that seven schools' essays aren't going to be that much different. Yeah. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I'm not terribly surprised, Benjamin, at this kind of stuff. I've uh, uh, I, I've stopped being surprised at the surprise. Um, and some of the uh, you know most uh, select uh, some of the most selective schools, like you know whatever you think one, two, three, four is right. Uh, uh, I, I found that those schools, uh, like if I were to show you ten candidates. Uh, and, and we agree, let's say, we have consensus on who the most qualified is and who the least qualified is, you'd be surprised at who they take. They'll take seven, they'll take three, they'll take nine. It's like, what? What about one and two? They're superstars. Like, yeah, they might be superstars, but they might already have a couple of those profiles already. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so differentiation to make sure that all of you are as unicornish as you can be is really important. Gotcha. I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to either GMAT or GRE, mm -hmm. I've heard that the data sufficiency is harder on the GMAT yeah. and the GRE is more suited for English speakers. Uh, is there either one that you would recommend or would you say, hey, based off of doing well in English in college, uh, I would uh -huh. suggest GRE or something like that? Yeah, this is uh, the a, almost an age-old question. Um, so well, the, uh, my answer has a few parts because it has to. Um, this is what uh, this is what I I know. Um, uh, almost every school at this moment on July twenty sixth will say we are indifferent um, as to which school which test you use. We're indifferent. Uh, some schools say we do not value one test more than the other, uh, uh, and other schools will not say that. They'll say we accept both the GMAT and the GRE. So they're actually kind of you know quiet on their preference. Okay, what I have found in talking to admissions people over the years, they actually have a preference. They actually have a preference, and it's a GMAT. And that's the GMAT, really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is, yeah, it is. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to name names if I get in trouble here. But yeah, I've heard that many times over many years at many different schools. Mm -hmm. No, we prefer the GMAT. Okay. G, like, and it, uh, there's, there's a lot more I got to say, Benjamin. Like, we prefer the GMAT, and here's why. It's the business school test. Let's just start there. Who created the GMAT? Business schools created the GMAT. In, in, and they created this nonprofit called the GMAC. They created a, they created a test for, to, uh, ostensibly, test things that business school requires. And they have a 70-year track record with it. So they understand how things work out or don't work out. So if all else equal, yes, GMAT's better than the GRE for a business school. And like the GMAT will tell you, like 85% of applicants use the uh, the GMAT to get in. Okay. But here, there's a lot more to this story, unfortunately. It's, it's a really complicated question. Um, most schools will not, some schools will, like NYU, surprised me in their employment report or in their class profile they said that uh two-thirds of their students got in with the gmat and uh another whatever uh a few like a minuscule one or two percent got in through the ea the executive assessment and the rest got into gre i was surprised at that because most schools don't tell you that that's a little bit of the sausage being made um here's the here's the thing though the standardized test is just one component of the application. It's 25%, 30%, 40%, maybe, I don't know. It's a black box and it's difference by school. But if the other elements of the application are spectacular or all above average, the standardized test component could be below average and you can easily sail in, right? So if we have, if we have like, wow, the, the, uh, an a, a plus job, a plus job, and a plus uh, academic transcript. We have these extracurriculars that are just a unicorn wild card. Who cares if they give us a GRE? Who cares? That's fine. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Like so, um, if and this is where self awareness comes in. 
if your if your profile is like wait a minute i'm above median here 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 then maybe i can be below median at the standardized cast component and still sail in and that's where self-awareness comes in it gmat is better than gre all else equal but here's the thing all else is never equal that's i have to add i have to add that all else is not equal now if we're just saying you know what dude i'm pretty much normal everywhere my job's normal it's fine against admits it's fine my my gpa is fine against admits at these schools like all the other profiles my extra triplets or whatever fine recommendation can be fine whatever i'm basically fine across the board i am not a unicorn what should i do gmat jury right well that's a more complicated question and what that should what what a person should do at that point is realize that it's not apples to apples. So even if the the GRE presents a uh, a math experience that's easier, like the day sufficiency doesn't exist, right, Benjamin? It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, they have what they call con eighty comparison, which is the their version of it, but it's a little bit easier um, version of of that uh, discipline. Um, what you have to realize is this. The percentiles matter. Like the, the business school admissions people know what the tests are. And they don't uh, treat them, they don't treat the scores in equivalent ways. So 70 percentile quant on the on the on the GRE is a roughly like 50 percentile quant. I'm a little rough here, but that's about right. 50 percentile quant on the GMAT. Like that's what it is. Unfortunately, a, a lot of people on Reddit and posts and quants and just you know, talking, they say, "Well, I got seventy percentile quant on the GMAT on, on the GRE, and I got you know fifty five percentile quant on the GMAT. I should do GRE. The GRE was easier. Ye no, you did better on the GMAT. You didn't know that, but you did better on the GMAT. That's a better score because they know they know the conversions. They know apples to apples. Uh, so you know what I mean? Yeah. And and uh, on the verbal side, uh, this is maybe more than you want, but because the GRE separates their math and their verbal. Their verbal doesn't really matter so much. They're not the the MBA admissions people are not worried about any of your ability to handle the English curriculum. Like, is that really writing? This is not business school. Is not, you're not going to be, be reading that many books. To be honest with you, you're not going to be doing that many papers. Uh, there's a lot of group projects. They're not worried about your ability to converse in this language. Um, and so the the GRE verbal is actually relative to the GMAT. Uh, and some of you know this because I've, I've talked to you. Uh, it's pretty nasty. The GRE verbal is pretty hard, and because the pool of people who takes a GRE and who are being separated by the GRE, a lot of them are readers, or future academics, or future historians. Well, yeah, guess what? Reading comp's harder on that test. It just is. Uh, the reading comp of the GRE is harder than reading comp of the GMAT. But no question. And the GRE vocabulary stuff, I don't know what to say. That's good luck. It's not easy. It's not easy. So the GRE verbal is actually harder uh, than the GR than the GMAT verbal. And this is really inside baseball, and I'll end it here. The GMAT is only one score that flows into uh, uh, that, that is has two components of math and verbal. So it's a one single score between 200, 200 800 with components. And the, the dirty, well, little known, I'm not going to call it dirty. The little known fact is those components are not equal. Math and verbal aren't equally weighted uh, now. Uh, uh, the, the, G, the, the, the verbal input uh, on the overall score is higher on the GMAT than it is the quant. And people don't know that. Um, uh, and that's there's a lot of political factors why, but mostly it's because um, the US standards in math aren't that high. Um, and they've had to recalibrate the the distribution that that's I, I i can i can say that pretty confidently but uh, i don't want to go any further publicly in recording <laughs> than that but uh but just but just know that uh um uh the verbal input on the gmat is absurdly high uh to compensate for relative weakness among us-based uh, students in math skills so long story short i would try the gmat first if you can get good there, that's the way to sh just shut everyone up. We're good. And if you can't get good there, 
then it's worth testing your water, uh, testing the GRE waters, because they're, your your GMAT preparation will mostly translate over. They're not like that different tests. They'll mostly translate over, and give them a decent GRE score. Then, but just notice that the percentiles aren't the same. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just had to say all of that because uh, the simple answer isn't. I don't think it would be helpful. There's a, there's a lot there um, that I just have to tell you. Anybody else? So I have a question that uh, you mentioned kind of a while back, the short, long-term goal questions in some of the applications. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your recommendation? I I've heard kind of overwhelmingly just be fully transparent, right? So, you know, kind of starting the process, you get the sense that MBA programs want people who are going to change the world. Um, mm -hmm. And you kind of, at least from from my research, I was like, oh man, I, I don't necessarily have some sort of like revolutionary idea that's driving me towards an MBA, you know, yeah, will that put me at a disadvantage. But then what I've heard from talking to people is that it's okay to be upfront and say, you know, to be totally honest, straight out of my MBA, I'd like to go work for a big, for a big three consulting firm or a major right. bank or something like that, you know, with an interesting follow on goal after that. But how do you recommend balancing that and framing that? Because on the one hand, the applicants that they boast about are the ones with kind of these these lofty ideas whereas on the back end they brag about um, median salaries right so it's it's kind of talking out of both sides of their mouths so how do you recommend on the application framing that <laughs> that's a very thoughtful question yes um, <laughs> uh, the, the short-term goal has to be super tight and relevant and something they can help you with Okay, uh, so many of the applications will ask you in like 50 characters, yo, where are you working? Like, give us your short term goal. Now, there's some schools that are outliers and don't ask, like MIT doesn't ask that kind of stuff or anything like that. But, um, and uh, some schools are just like, oh, we don't, we don't even worry about what you think you're, you're going to do because you're going to change. You're going to come here and we're going to change your world or change everything about you, uh, your outlooks. So we don't need you to say something now. But most schools aren't like that. Most schools will ask you in essay format, what are your goals and how can our school help you achieve those goals? And also in the application portal in like uh, like five, six words, what is the position of the job? Like, where is this job that you're gonna get? That's that's the, the typical school. And, and so I would say for all of you, your short-term goal should be super tight and something that um, wouldn't give the MBA admissions person pause. They want to make sure your outcomes are successful. They want to make sure that what you want to do happens here, right? Uh, they want to under, have an understanding of what you'll be recruiting for, because recruiting for this, you know, the summer internship starts, you know, not that long after you land on campus. I know some schools have like, you know, a barricade uh, because they have the wherewithal to do it. Like, no, no, don't touch our students for a while. We don't, don't, don't bother them until, you know, uh, the spring. But most schools aren't like that. Most schools are like, no, no, you're going to start trying to get your job by October. And uh, that's when your MBB interviews start, you know, for the spring, uh, for, for, uh, for, for summer. So my advice would be give them a very tangible goal that, that's honest uh, and that's doable. So I would look at the employment report to see, you know, uh, which employers work in the fields that you might want to jump into. Uh, and uh, I'd give this something very tangible. The long-term goal is where you can do a stretch. The long-term goal is where you can do kind of a passion thing um, uh, because that's where you can change the world if you have any ideas to do that, you know? But my short-term goal would be very practical. I know for a fact they get nervous if the short-term goal is like this massive pivot that's impractical because then it's like, I don't think, they might reject the student or the applicant because this ain't gonna work here. Let me just do this kid a favor, you know. So if your goal is MBB, if that's legit, great. That's easy. Check. We can do that here. There, you know, there are three of our top seven recruiters. No worries. We can do that here, you know. Okay, great. If, no, if, you, if, if your goals, if any of your goals aren't like uh, consulting, big tech, or banking, uh, then it's okay. That's, you don't have to conform to those three silos. 
Um, but I would try to make sure that uh, I can find people in their uh, employers in the employment report that match your goals. So if you want to work in uh, manufacturing uh, electric vehicles, I would make sure that their employment report has Ford and Rivian in it. You know what I mean? Because you want to at least give them a sense that, oh, we can do this here. People have come here and done this. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's helpful. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes early on when you see people applying saying, like I said, with all these, these big grand ideas and, you know, maybe here I am saying, well, MBB sounds pretty good, right? No, so. I would say MBB. Cause like, to be honest with you, those big grand ideas isn't, aren't probably what they sold <laughs> in, in their application. Those big grand ideas kind of happened to them. <laughs> when they got there or through some experiential stuff uh at in their internship but no it's unlikely that the big grand ideas are what they sold at their short-term goal okay great i appreciate I'm it just, i'm just telling you and in yeah. the vast majority even if it, even if it <laughs> even even if they did tell this outlandish uh short-term goal uh that is not who gets it to school like the 99 plus percent of people are like telling them you know, transitions that I don't know, they help with transitions that uh, they actually help people do. So if it's MBB, it sounds pretty good. You're like, oh, that sounds like pretty intellectually challenging. The money's pretty good. Good. Say that. Okay. All right. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, say that. It's, it works. 40% yeah, of the students do that anyway. So it's not a problem. You talked earlier, Nafiz, about the Division One uh, football, or not football, but athletics. Right. Um, speaking about um, extracurricular, both in undergrad and your, you know, for us in the military. What is your yeah. thought on that? So, say someone. I think probably most people here are applying soon or in round two. Um, I've heard of people mm -hmm. saying things like, oh, I need, get, I need to get an extra curriculum on my resume. And yeah. do you think that's something that, you know, maybe someone here is two or three years out. Is that worth it to go and say, hey, I'm going to go try and start a food drive or I'm going to go start a nonprofit or some sort? Um, and how do you yeah. accentuate what you did in your undergrad without seeming like you're, uh, you know, like you, you went to a meeting and said you yeah. were you know, the founder of the club. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one way, one way they check that stuff is they also ask in the portal, like, how many hours a week did you commit to this? <laughs> so, so this extra curricular, like, like, what did you do here? And they make you add up your hours and like, oh, so you, so you uh, worked 200 hours last week, huh? So uh, that's one of their checks. Like, how many hours did you commit to this? Um, in general, um, unless you're, uh, undergrad extracurriculars are superlative. I wouldn't really talk too much about them. Uh, I, I really wouldn't. Uh, marketing club this or Habitat that. I'd, it's fine to mention it. I'm not sure. It'd be, I'm not even sure it would take spots on my resume, unless I led the club or something like that. Or I was the, the president of the club. I don't even sure it'd be making it on my resume because it's going to make it into the portal, the application portal. Um, but uh, D1 athletics or even you know D2, anything that took 20, 30 hours a week, like that's cool. That could be on your resume. That's a that's a that's a that's a job. Um, now for uh, service people, uh, active duty. Listen, you, you you all get a pass. Your life is service. You know, your social impact is your job. So uh, any kind of extracurricular you can do um, uh, is is a bonus. Let's call that a bonus. It's not necessary. It's just a bonus. Uh, I just think it's an opportunity though to. Uh, uh, make your pivot more real and 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 show that you're really sincere about this pivot you want to make you know so i just think it's an opportunity if you can't do it because geez you're deployed somewhere like you get a pass of course you, you can't do that um i wouldn't just start a nonprofit for the sake of nonprofit, but like i would just join on to a nonprofit's already doing something and it, it could be as simple as mentoring mentoring is great like you don't have to start your own thing to be a mentor in some some kid you know um uh, so that, that's what I would do. If you had the wherewithal, and there's also, you know, ways to do this virtually through Zoom and whatnot, um, I would see whether I can add something that's at least adjacent uh, to my pivot. 
uh, I can volunteer for, and maybe maybe it's through the guy uh, through the lens of mentorship. But uh, I wouldn't have to. I wouldn't start my own nonprofit. That's a that's a big job, you know. I'm finding. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, no, uh, th for all service people, this is a nice bonus thing to make your story more credible. Um, to uh, non-service people, private sector people, I, it, to me, that's not a bonus. You have to show. You have to show that you spend a few hours thinking about somebody else for every. And I, I would, I would, and I would minimize I, I the college stuff. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, to add on, I, this is one thing that surprised me. Um, uh, fortunately, I don't have stress right now thinking through this, but when I applied, the portal, you, you mentioned that that's going to be that some of your portal. Um, maybe speak a little bit. That was something that kind of surprised me when I got on and realized, like, oh my goodness, it's not just upload a resume, uh, into your, your social security. Yeah, they're invasive. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're invasive. They, Those they were. Yes. Ask you it was a uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so and so for all of you working on your resume, just know that your resume, please don't make it exhaustive. Your resume is not your CV. Your resume is just your highlights. Your resume is telling a little story, the highlights of your story. It's not the exhaustive story. You don't have to mention everything you've ever done. Uh, the portal will get it. They'll they'll capture all of it. They'll capture you know everything about your jobs and your life. How much your your extracurriculars there? So your, your resume just should be a nice document that is uh, um, has is loaded with little conversation pieces, um, and wherever possible, uh, to Thomas's question, wherever possible, makes anyone who doesn't know your job realize that you're really good at it. You know, you want to write this uh, document. Uh, to people who aren't, who don't do what you do, and then can tell very quickly, oh, I'm, I'm dealing with a, a pretty serious candidate, someone who's you know, done really well um, over the last several years. Anything else? I think uh, I know we're probably at time, but you know, if anyone else has something burning, I'd be happy to help. This is very specific, so if yeah. other people have questions, you know, that are more general, then obviously, you know, more than welcome to ask first. I had a question specifically about the video for Sloan, mm -hmm. uh, but before I ask, does anyone have anything else like that they're looking to get in that's you know not about a specific school? All right, Owen, I think, go yeah, ahead. Owen, I think you have the floor. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Owen. So, so the video, um, you mentioned Sloan's application being kind of a unicorn. Um, yeah. I, I am realizing that as I'm filling it out, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to Wyatt's point about the portals being invasive. Yeah, they're, they're pretty awful. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah. But, uh, but, but, you know, Sloan's is definitely, the application is, is in some ways more, more broad, um, than some of the others. So with the video, that being unique, along with the organizational chart, that one's a little bit more straightforward, but with the video, mm -hmm. what, um, they're, they're broad with kind of the prompt for it. What have you seen be successful or how do you even really begin to approach that? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about, um, um, you know, the content of the video so much. Like you only, I know you only have a, like a minute or so, right? Uh, my, my quick advice would be, I would video it if possible at, at a place you like, uh, perhaps outside, let that be a character in your story. Um, uh, you know, Sloan isn't, Sloan's pretty, you know, laced up here, right? So you don't wanna be like, too creative necessarily, but um, it, it's not a bad idea to, you know, to have a nice uh, backdrop, like uh, like looking at, like your your camera's looking out the window, and it, it's a it's a nice scene somewhere or someplace you love, like in the outdoors. What they're trying to do with these uh, video essays, and you know, Sloan's not the only one that does them, but like what they're trying to do is like get a sense: is this a is this is this a robot? Now, sincerely, is this a robot? 
because we see a resume, we see some essays, and the essays might be, you know, pretty conformist, right? Like they're, you know, most of the essays are saying, you know, the same three jobs or the pivots, you know what I mean? So like, how do we know this person is, get a sense of this person, how this person uh, would vibe with anybody, how this person gels, uh, and whether this person is just, you know, human, uh, humanity. So I wouldn't get, uh, I would not go too buttoned up necessarily. It's okay if you wear a tie, but I, I don't think you have to. But it's more about like, you tell them a story, okay? You tell them a story uh, uh, that that resonates with you, that is, uh, that can, I don't know, that maybe maybe not something your best man would say, um, like, <laughs> but like something that in like in a minute or so, like, oh, that's, that's all. That's what I would try to find. Like, just like, tell them a story about what you care about, um, outside's good, but it's not really about the, the presentation of the video. It's just like, give them some content that shows that Owen, Carter, Benjamin, Justin, Nick, that you, Thomas, that you're all humans. And that's the most important thing. This is more of like a human, not human check mark. That's, that's my, that's what I've been told. Okay. So, I mean, it sounds, you know, fairly low threat as long as you can come across as personable. Yes, absolutely. Low threat is a good word. Yes. Personable, yes. And that's why, like, I know, I know, um, like, I know, like, for example, Yale uh, has this essay too, video essay, and they don't really tell you what the questions are. They'll give you a, maybe a list you can choose from maybe, but like, they're not gonna give you much time to prepare because they just wanna see whether the person's human. The less preparation the person has, the more chance that we can actually get the essence of the person. So that's what these essays are for. They're like, well, what kind of person is this person? And can we, um, you know, not that this is a perfect way of doing it, but it's the best way they got. Before we interview this person, um, can we tell this person is actually going to play well in the sandbox? This is one last quick one. I'm sorry for for hogging all the time. Um, the inter the the probability of admission based off of receiving an interview or not. I've seen that that's usually people say fifty percent. Is that in your experience accurate? Is it is it does it go up that much if you get an interview? Oh wow, um, that varies by school. I've I've seen all kinds of like up and down data on that. I, I think a uh, this is this is a very rough rule of thumb that you can't sign up that, that I cannot sign off for. But it's, I would say this is just a rough heuristic. Basically, the interview double whatever the school's admit chances are, your your chances are now doubled. So that that's, that's basically what it works. How it works out. It could be as high as fifty percent. You know, based off what we're looking at, they might they they might uh, you know uh, accept one out of every two interviewees maybe. But I have not seen consistency here. Uh, a lot of it's also bandwidth related, like how many people they have to interview people, you know? Um, and the pandemic has has changed that as well. So uh, rough rule of thumb is if you got an interview, nice job, you're competitive. And you're probably not just competitive at that school, you're probably competitive at a lot of different schools. So interviews are great. It means that, like, especially like, you know, at your list, if you get interviewed at any of those lists at any of your schools, Wow, great. You're probably not gonna get shut out from a top five, 10 school. I'm not sure which one would take you, but like, it's good, it's a good sign. Because no one has the time to waste anyone else's, you know? So that's how I would shake it. Like basically my chances have now doubled from the thing. But it might be as high as 50% now, I guess. But the only reason I'm kind of cagey here is because I know people who got in to some of these schools without interviewing. I know, I know that's like an outlier, but I, I've seen it. So I, I don't say about the numbers. Well, hey, Nafiz, really appreciate you coming on. For those here also, um, we're gonna do this again, um, I think in a week. I'll send out, I, I, you are, you are, you are all already on the distro list. I think, I, it's send eight, this out. I think it's the 18th, right? Why? The 18th. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. We're mm -hmm. doing the 18th. So mm -hmm. that's, um, you know, 
like Nafi said, be as personal as you as you need to be. You know, don't don't be uh don't be intimidated. I mean, like he said, it, it is being recorded, so uh, nothing too crazy. But um, if you guys want to jump on, chances are that your question will probably lead to an answer that helps someone else's. So feel free to come back and ask if he's like, hey, I want to go this direction with my essay. You know, yeah. there's three weeks left until until round one. What do you think? Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'll send that all out to you guys. And um, we had some issues with our YouTube channel, but we, we got the, the first one up and we're going to put this one up as well. Um, so there was just a, an issue apparently with uh, with YouTube and a previous video, but we've gotten that resolved. So um, thanks a bunch to Unifees and to everyone else. Thanks, Wyatt. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, thank you everyone on the call for uh, participating. And if there's anything I can do to help you, just don't be, don't be bashful. Um, uh, service people are core to our mission um, as this nonprofit. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Dave. Thanks.